back to Rhythm and Joy Cafe. My name is Ryan, this is my wife Janine, and we have a great uh, song we want to share with you tonight. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's just awesome. I, 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 I just want to dive in. Let's go. Yeah. What do you got? So we are talking about Stevie Wonder's Sir Duke. Wow. And yeah, it's been quite the journey learning about this, um, this song and uh, learning more about Stevie Wonder. So uh, we're going to start by talking a little bit about the album, Songs in the Key of Life. Okay. And this came out in 1976, and uh, then the single was released in 1977. Hmm. And it's really a compilation, um, the Songs in the Key of Life, of Stevie um, talking about life. And so each song represents some element of life that he thought was really important. Mm -hmm. And um, my favorite on the songs in the Key of Life album is Sir Duke. Yeah. And, and because it talks about music and it talks about how powerful it is mm. for human beings to experience it and how we feel it. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Stevie and then go into the song and um, we'll learn a little bit about the musicians and um, not only the musicians who were on the album, but the musicians that Stevie talks about in the song. Nice. Yeah. A, a biography that's worth getting is mm. called Blind Faith. Yes. And this is a biography of Stevie's mother, Lulu Hardaway. And um, you'll learn quite a bit about him there, more than we'll go into here. Mm -hmm. But um, she had a bit of a tough life. Yeah. Uh, but boy, she was the perfect mother for Stevie. Yeah. And Stevie was born in Steveland Hardaway Judkins, six weeks premature on May 13th, 1950 in Saginaw, Michigan. He was in an incubator for almost two months and somewhere in that process, some say it was oxygen, some say it was heat or the temperature, but he lost his sight. Mm. And so from you know infancy, he has been blind. And not only that, he faced poverty, hunger, and an abusive father. Mm. When he was about four years old, his mother saved up enough money to escape. So she actually, yeah, escaped from, from um, CB's dad and got a house in uh, the Detroit area and um, that's where Stevie began to be exposed to music. Now he used to take pots and pans and, and drum and um, started playing the harmonica and on the neighbor's piano he learned to play you know piano there and just really had a super ear for music. Mm. And um, so one day he he wasn't supposed to go across the street, but some friends took him across the street and he heard some music there that really impacted him. And not only that, he was introduced to people who introduced him to Motown. Yeah. And so he was taken to Motown and, and um, <coughs> really, you know, kind of the rest is history. He hung out there and got to know most of the artists there mm. and uh, just loved it. He was like in heaven, mm. just being around all that music and had a fantastic ear. One of the really um, moving things was in, again, his mother's biography, um, you know, she's, she's feeling sorry for this boy, right, because he can't see and mm he never felt sorry for himself. Mm -hmm. And one of the quotes, in fact, I think I will read this one. He said, my mother would cry about my blindness and the hopelessness of me ever seeing. But I told her I wasn't sad. I believed God had something for me to do. Yeah. Um, he said, mama was my greatest teacher, a teacher of compassion, love, and fearfulness. If love was, a, if love was sweet as a flower, then my mother is that sweet flower of love. Mm -hmm. uh, he also says that just because a man lacks the use of his eyes, it doesn't mean he lacks vision. 
Yes. And of course, that was definitely the case, right? He yeah. did not lack any vision. Not at, at all. Yeah. You know, what's remarkable too, something I learned in those uh, documentaries that you watched in mm -hmm. regards to that, mm -hmm. um, he oftentimes saw more mm -hmm. than those around mm -hmm. him who could actually physically see. Yes. And yes. he demonstrated that mm -hmm. uh, time and time again. And so that's just really remarkable yeah. to the ability in the, of the senses of the human mm -hmm. body and mm -hmm. how when one is lacking, the others take mm -hmm. over. And um, it's really remarkable. It is, yeah. yeah. He could always tell who would come into the room. That's yeah. something that, that yeah. musicians and friends have been just baffled about mm -hmm. for uh, many, many years is that you, someone walks in the, the door and he knows who it is. So, um, yeah, that, yeah, that sight that um, goes beyond the eyes. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yep, for sure. So, Stevie was under contract, yes, with, with Motown. And um, one of the great stories is that Motown wanted him to sign this, this contract. And well, wanted his mother basically on his right. behalf to sign it, mm -hmm. and she didn't like it. She didn't like the the amount of control that they had, and and uh, she did not want to sign it. Well, Stevie was just crushed, mm -hmm. and he decided to start playing the drums until she relented. So for days he played the drums, day and night. Yes, just nonstop. Yeah, he would just break to eat and wouldn't talk to her and, and until his hands were bleeding yeah. and um, finally she relented and, and took him back to Motown. And yeah. That was just really, it was really an emotional part of the book, um, mm -hmm. you know, for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know what uh, struck me about that mm -hmm. um, was that although she herself uh, was not really you know didn't really understand contracts or especially mm -hmm. in the music industry mm -hmm. and all of that she had the motherly instinct mm -hmm. to care for him yes. and to make sure that whatever uh, they did going forward that was always in yes. his best interest yes. and so she she took it to Barry Gordy right yes. yeah. and um, she got what she wanted and um, sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a way and, a and of course Barry got what he wanted to some degree. It yeah. was a great negotiation. So I just thought that was fabulous. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of talked about, you know, in past videos about how the parents, um, you know, look out for and support and encourage their children uh, through this process. And she certainly did that. Yes. Yeah. She did. Yeah. She watched, really and did. just took care of him the whole time. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he, he becomes a little wonder, right? Um, so one of the songs that he's really known for, you know, is the one that goes like, everybody say hey. Yeah. <laughs> Fingertips was really yeah. one of his first big hits. Right? I think he was about 13 when he did that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. He, yeah. Just kind of the rest is yeah, and they and they they get they go in pretty deep on that one on the on the documentary too. So that yes. was a lot of fun. Yeah. So let's see, what do I want to talk about next? What I do remember about that song, yes. "Fingertips," though, yes. um, was that it really showcased his ability to command the audience. Yes. At such a young age, yes. just remarkable. Mm -hmm. You know, the, his ability to get them going and into the song and they just kept they just kept going. Yes. They ended up having to kind of hook them off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> so, cuz they're pretty heavy into time constraints and mm -hmm. so cuz there was at that with that kind of um, show that they were doing there were sev several artists, Motown artists that were mm -hmm. performing and and so yeah, he he had the crowd going. Yeah. So, it was awesome. I love yeah. that. Yeah, and that kind of became a signature thing, right? Yeah. To take him off the stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, what what a gift he really had a gift, and um, and has made some very good use of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe we should listen to the song. Oh, nice, good. Right. And then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about about the song. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Music is a world within itself with a language. 
iconic tunes of all time. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when that came out? Uh, I was about 10 years old. Oh. Okay. And, um, you know, as I've mentioned before, that I was, I was kind of into different music, mm -hmm. but this one permeated that. Okay. Uh, of all of the pop type tunes, yeah. This one was everywhere, yeah. and so you couldn't help but hear it mm -hmm. and just really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, there's just such a positive message. Yes. Uh, the music actually uh, in my estimation, is one of the best um, uh, uh, developed the music uh, as it's juxt juxtaposed against the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of it just came together. Mm -hmm. It was just fabulous. Uh, yeah, so I mean, how can you not love this song? Yes, right? it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. So, the lyrics, right? Um, and it's always been, from the first time I heard it, it's one of those that you feel like you want to move. Yeah. <laughs> which kind of fits in right with, with Stevie's lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. Music is a world within itself, with a language we all understand, with an equal opportunity for all to sing and dance and clap their hands. But just because a record has a groove doesn't make it in the groove. But you can tell right away at letter A when the people start to move. They can feel it all over, they can feel it all over people. 
they can feel it all over. They can feel it all, all over people. So first verse uh, in chorus. And just as I was saying, as soon as you hear right from letter A, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can move. Like, yeah. you can feel it. And there are some songs like that, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some that aren't. So he's really got a good point <laughs> yeah. in that. Um, I know for me, like, Bee Gees tend to be like that. Like, as yeah. soon as it starts, you, like, you feel like you want to move. Like, yeah. you just want to start grooving, right? Or Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. or, you know, a lot of yes, that's true. Yep. Very yep. true. Um, even Mahalia Jackson. Yeah. Actually, um, the gospel songs. Yeah. You feel like you want to just kind of yeah. move along. Um, but, boy, he's really captured, captured that yeah. here in this verse, yeah. right? Music. It's a world within itself. Isn't that the truth? No doubt about it. It affects every person on the planet. Yes. Every, every person on the planet. Yeah. And definitely a language we all understand. Yep. Right. That's you know, and that's evidenced by the fact that any one artist can travel the world, and they've got mm -hmm. fans. I mean, you know, not every artist, but I mean, a lot of them that make it big. You know, Michael yeah. Jackson, Stevie Wonder. I mean, all of these artists, they travel the world, and they've got thousands of fans wherever they go. Yeah. And you know, I was thinking about this earlier that, you know, the 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 countries that they travel to, they don't speak the English language in in most cases, but yet it transcends that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of obviously a lot of these countries speak English as a second language mm -hmm. a lot of people but for the most part that whole thing just translates yes. and um, yes. it, it transcends mm -hmm. um, so yeah. any any culture you mm -hmm. know with good music can mm -hmm. it can speak to them so yeah and we're I mean we're not just talking rock or jazz we're talking classical spiritual I mean there's just pretty much anytime you start singing or humming or picking up a musical instrument it's a language anyone can understand, yeah. right? Drumming, mm -hmm. um, dancing, just the whole element of music is right. universal. Absolutely. And I think this is like one of the most important songs ever written. Uh, yeah, I would agree. You know, from, from that perspective. Yeah. There's unity in that. Yes. Right? Yes. It's not device, divisive mm -hmm. at all. It brings people together, mm -hmm. and the music exemplifies that. Yes, yes. So an equal opportunity, right? There you go. Rich, poor, anybody can dance, anybody can move to yeah. music, anyone can enjoy it. So really important there in that in the first yeah. you know, first few lines. Yep. Um, and just because a record has a groove doesn't make it in the groove, right? But you can tell right away at letter A when the people start to move, yeah. as we were just talking about mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. So um, they can feel it all over. Yes, we as people, we can feel it all over, mm -hmm. right? When we move, when we've got that groove going on. Okay, so music knows it is and always will be one of the things in life that just won't quit. Mm -hmm. Here are some of music's pioneers that time will not allow us to forget. So yeah, music, it doesn't quit. Like, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just gonna be, right? Yeah. Like, you can't stop it. And so music's pioneers. So Stevie has called this song Sir Duke, right, which is in honor of Duke Ellington. Right. But he first mentions Basie, Count Basie, Miller, Glenn Miller, Satchmo, which of course is Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. and then the King of All, Sir, Sir Duke, and with a voice like Ella's ringing out, there's no way the band could lose. Right. So Count Basie, wow, we, we really had some fun looking into the lives of these musicians. Mm -hmm. And um, so Count Basie really was known for an American jazz pianist, organist, and band leader and composer. In 1935, he formed the Count Basie Orchestra. And in 1936, he took them, took them to Chicago for a long engagement and their first recording. He led the group for almost 50 years, creating innovations like the use of two split tenor saxophones Emphasizing the rhythm section, riffing, riffing with a big <laughs> riffing with a big band, using arrangers to broaden their sound and others. So yeah, the whole element of splitting the tent, the saxophones, yeah. and kind of filling in in between. Yeah. Um, so he was a pioneer mm -hmm. in in many ways, you know, yeah. in that respect. Um, 
And then, okay, so do you want any other comments about Well, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I recognized when when we looked at, uh, you know, some of the documentaries about his life, mm -hmm. um, when you see uh, him perform and his band perform on a stage, they oftentimes had he, him at the piano, mm -hmm. the bassist and the drums kind of off to yeah. the side, and the rest of the band was had their own section. Mm -hmm. And you could tell one of the things that I really liked about them is that they would they would groove, yes. you know, the, the, the rhythm section. Yes. You, you know, they would have their own little groove going. And it's almost, to me, kind of the precursor. yeah the precursor to uh, what later would become rock and roll music. Yeah, or the five the, you know, yeah, yeah, like a five, you know, five mm -hmm. person or four person, you know, whatever um, uh, group. So that was kind of the precursor to that. And I would love how he would utilize that, you know, drum, bass, piano, um, and it was it was just awesome. To be honest with you, I hadn't I hadn't known much about Count Basie or Duke Ellington or uh, Glenn Miller. Glenn, well, I actually was fairly familiar with Glenn Miller. My dad liked Glenn Miller a lot, so I heard heard it from him. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other ones I hadn't known a whole lot about. Obviously, I've heard of them, but to go in and dig into their lives, it was awesome, and um, just really learned a lot about music. Uh, and the creation of music yes. and and the longevity that mm -hmm. these people had some of these in all of these groups some of the the musicians stayed with these people for years yes. um, and it was just it was mm -hmm. just awesome I, I loved the, the, this yes. journey so one of the cool things about watching you know some of these documentaries is that you you do learn a little bit about the members of these bands as well yes. right? the soloists and um, just expert, expert oh. musicians. Yeah. I mean, the level of artistry was just yeah. exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those trumpet players, oh my goodness. Exactly. I mean, they were all phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Cat Anderson yeah. on the trumpet. <laughs> Cat's phenomenal. Yes. Awesome. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about Glenn Miller. Um, I did not. I, I had not known, you know, I mean, I've listened to quite a bit of Glenn Miller, but I did not know that he disappeared. Yeah. That his plane was possibly shot down in World War II and that he's never been found, right? right. Yeah. But he did say when he joined um, the, the armed forces that he didn't, he knew he wasn't coming back. Yeah. Glenn Miller was an American big band trombonist, a range of composer and band leader in the swing era. He was the best-selling recording artist from 1939 to 1942, leading one of the best-known big bands. Miller arranged his band around a clarinet and a tenor saxophone, playing melody and three other saxophones playing harmony. The band became the most popular and commercially successful dance orchestra of the swing era, one of the greatest singles charting acts of the 20th century, yeah. yeah. What I appreciated about him was that he had a very patriotic streak in yes. him, right? He was compelled. Yes. Um, he was. They were. They were clicking right along, and they were in their prime, and and um, you know, he he was willing to leave it all. Yeah. He didn't have to. He didn't have to, yeah. uh, but he was willing to leave. In fact, he was older than the draft age. Yes. Um, so he he wasn't required to go at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I think he was what in his thirties or something when he when he entered the the services. Yes. His patriotism was was something that I that I just was amazed at. Um, he felt so compelled to go in, and uh, once he got there, of course he turned uh, you know the musicians that were in the service. Uh, yeah. it, they became they themselves became. A, a force to be reckoned with musically. Mm -hmm. um, it inspired a whole new different type of music. Um, you know, he, he, he took, you know, a lot of the marches and things like that to a whole new level. And um, it's been said, um, you know, when, while they travel around, um, you know, that they were one of the most inspiring, mm -hmm. uplifting um, events that yes. soldiers would get a chance yes. to see. Okay, next to a letter from home. Hmm the Glenn Miller band was the highest morale booster. Yes, there you go. Yeah. 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 
amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just an incredible talent and the ability to take, you know, he did it with his band and then to go into the service. And some of his band members went into the service also. Yes, yes. Not all of them, but of them. yeah, not Quite all of them, but some. He was born March 1st, 1904, Alton Glenn Miller, and he disappeared December 15th, 1944. Yeah. You know what was interesting about that day? Mm -hmm. He was also supposed to fly with several of his men. Yes. And were they, they were concerned about possible ice building on, mm -hmm. on the wings or something because of the weather. Um, so he basically said to all of his men, mm -hmm. you stay behind and take a different flight. Mm -hmm. He was the only one mm -hmm. of, their, of their group that was on that flight. Yeah. And, the, you know, it's just, uh, you know, again, it's somebody who is really in tune Mm -hmm. uh, with their mission mm -hmm. and um, in tune with their their people yes. and um, looking out for them yeah. in in big ways so that's uh, oh, I, I just yeah I was touched by that yes um, but Stevie added him into the song Stevie yeah Sir Duke yeah yep. yes I think he was really influential in the swing era energy yeah. right mm -hmm. So uh, next we have Lou, Louis Armstrong, um, born Louis Daniel Armstrong, and uh, nicknamed Satchmo. Mm -hmm. So he was an American trumpeter and vocalist, one of the most influential figures in jazz. Uh, his music had such an important effect on jazz history that many scholars, critics, and fans call him the first great jazz soloist. So um, before him, it was really more the whole band. So he brought out the um, you know, that artistic soloist player, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Where um, the soloists would really get to show their, their skills yeah. and kind of set that up as the norm, mm -hmm. right? So that was really kind of cool. The energetic swing rhythmic movements of his playing um, was a major influence on soloists in every genre of American popular music. His career spanned five decades in different eras in the history of jazz. <laughs> so, and his home in um, New York has become a museum. Yeah, right? yeah. So that's and great. so there's a little bit of a documentary on that too. You can find Oh, it on there's YouTube. some great, yeah. great document. We, we, we just could, couldn't watch them all. Yeah, what well, you could actually see inside his home, and that was pretty cool. Yes. Um, so yeah, he was born and raised in New Orleans, born August 4th, 1901, and died uh, July 6th, 1971. And again, this, all of these individuals mm -hmm. that he's talking about in this song, mm -hmm. they all have so much more influence, not just with their music, yes. but outside their music. Yes. Just in, mm -hmm. in social settings. And that's one of the things that I truly appreciate about mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong. When mm -hmm. at, in, his older, in his later years, he would be at home mm -hmm. a lot of the times, and the kids around yes. would come and sit on the stoop, and they'd play the trumpet together. Yeah. And he really inspired a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of the kids that were around uh, the home that he lived in. And um, so, just people with big hearts, yes. you know. Yeah. And I and I think honestly, you find that uh, you know through a lot of musicians, mm -hmm. it kind of goes. Hand, and I wouldn't say with everybody, but there, it's kind of a common theme. Mm -hmm. is that sort of giving back to the community um, that has helped you become you yes. know, who you are. Yes, but Stevie, he was re Stevie felt that he was really um, influential in his life yeah. as well. All right, so Duke, let's talk about Duke. Let's talk about Duke. Basie, Miller, Satchmo, and the king of all Sir Duke. Um, yeah, so Duke Ellington was the greatest jazz composer and band leader of his time. One of the originators of big band jazz, he led his band for more than 50 years and composed thousands of scores. Ellington showed how the American orchestra and uh, the American orchestra could achieve a perfect balance of music that was both shaped by the composer while also birthed on the spot by the musician. Um, Ellington died on May 24th, 1974. His last words were, music is how I live, why I live, and how I will be remembered. More mm -hmm. than 12,000 people attended his funeral. Yeah. Well, wow, we really were enjoyed yes. his biography yes. as well. And one of the things that stays with me about it was seeing him just there dancing with the band. Yeah. And that he says, you know, 
he, he's just a guy who wants to listen to music, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and he's been able to put together a bunch of guys that I'll just play for him every night. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he loved music and really enjoyed listening yeah. to it. That, that's one of the things that I appreciated about their um, the concerts that they would give. Mm -hmm. You know, he he's obviously a master at his craft. Mm -hmm. And would play some amazing song, play, play some amazing uh, things on the piano, but he would oftentimes just get up off the piano, yes. walk around, and as the soloists are playing, he's yes. just kind of grooving along, <laughs> yes. right? As yeah. he's kind of directing the band. But that's what you're talking about. He just, mm -hmm. he just, and I just love the way he would accentuate yes. the soloists because it wasn't just one or two soloists in his in his group mm -hmm. they all were phenomenal oh my goodness yes and uh, oftentimes when he would do an opening um, the one of their opening songs would they would have the soloists from each you know trumpet or I mean brass wind yes. whatever trombone they'd all come forward one yeah. at a time and just give a you know mm -hmm. oh it was amazing mm -hmm. yeah and they're all phenomenal yes so it's interesting that that Stevie Wonder you know, repeats this theme in the chorus. You can feel it all over. You can feel it all yeah. over. Can't you feel it all over? And that was such a theme for Duke Ellington, yeah. right, Sir Duke? Um, the the idea of being able to feel the music yeah. and listen to it, hear mm. it, and so um, very apropos, yeah. I think, to call this song Sir Duke. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stevie's just done a a fantastic job. Yeah. yeah. So next he mentions Ella Fitzgerald. Wow. And um, what a voice. Yes, yes. Uh, I read some a good biography of, about Ella when I was a teenager, hmm. actually. So that that's kind of always stuck with me. But Ella was an American jazz singer. Of course, then we looked up some stuff recently. But yeah. So Ella was an American jazz singer and sometimes referred to as the first lady of song. Queen of Jazz and Lady Ella. She was noted for her purity of tone, in impeccable diction, phrasing, timing, intonation, and a horn-like improvisational ability, particularly in her scat singing. Mm. Also, a pretty amazing range. Oh, phenomenal. Yes. So, Several octaves. Yes. Um, but yeah, what a, what a voice. And of course, that's what Stevie Wonder says in this song, right? with a voice like Ella's yeah. ringing out, there's no way the band can lose. Yeah. I mean, such rhythm. I mean, she was really just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Loved learning about her, yes. her career. There's some good performances of, with, of her with Count Basie and with Duke Ellington as well, and mm -hmm. with um, Louis Armstrong, right. too. Yeah, you can find those all over YouTube. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so yes, you can feel it all over. Can't you feel it all over, people? You can feel it all over everybody, all over people. Mm. Yeah. So those are really cool. the lyrics of the song. Yeah. Right? And, um, yep. yeah. Phenomenal song, mm -hmm. phenomenal musician, phenomenal person, all the way around. So one of the reasons that um, Stevie said he wanted to write this was a couple of his, of people who he had really admired. Um, Dinah Washington and Wes Montgomery had died before he had a chance to collaborate with them. He really wanted to collaborate with them. So when Duke Ellington died in 1974, Stevie Wonder wanted to write this song, acknowledging musicians he felt were important. Uh, and he said, I knew the title from the beginning, but wanted it to be about the musicians who did something for me. Soon they are forgotten. So soon they are forgotten. I wanted to show my appreciation. Wow. So uh, I think he certainly does. Yeah. Yeah, I think he does. Yeah, an amazing tribute song. Yes. So he also re-recorded this song in 1995 for the live album Natural Wonder. Oh, yeah. Um, but the recording that we listened to is actually from, from Stevie Wonder's Greatest Hits. And um, so... Yeah. That's the original one. Okay. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the music itself. The, mm. Yeah, the personnel. So Cashbox says that this song is attributed to jazz and roots with a beat that lies somewhere between jazz and funk and a horn section that dances on wind yes. feet. 
dances nice. on winged feet. Mm. Yeah. Um, that was kind of cool. Yeah. Well, he had a real knack for bringing musicians together. Um, and it sounds to me like he really started fresh mm -hmm. with this particular album. Um, you know, he went out and found musicians that he hadn't played with before that he, mm -hmm. you know, that were recommended to him or what have you, and they would come in and do an audition. Sometimes, um, you know, several guitar players would be in the studio at the same time, and he would be picking out, you know, number one, number two, number three, and they'd all play and and things like that, and then he would kind of whittle it down. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an interesting thing. You know, it's not just one person going in and sitting with him and, you know, they're trying to find a groove and see if they fit. No, yeah. he, this, this was like an open, um, open resume kind of uh, uh, interview. You know, mm -hmm. like you go in and there's four or five guys that you're competing against. And I just, I thought that was really interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if people had done that before or if they do that now or if that's, uh, yeah, I just don't know. But mm -hmm. I thought it was an interesting way to, to go yes. about choosing. Yes. You know, I think one of the things that that does is it tells you who can play under pressure. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, who can be in a setting and um, not be, um, you know, um, concerned about mm -hmm. the, you know, who, the, who they're there against or, I don't mean against, mm -hmm. but, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you get what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. So many, so many of the artists said that they spent hours, you know, three, four hours in that, in oh, that yeah. right, yeah. audition. And, um, in fact, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Michael um, Cimbello. But yeah, he said that, you know, he needed to go to the restroom, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, it had been a few hours and, and he asked, you know, like, can I take a break? <laughs> so Michael's story, okay, and Michael was playing lead guitar. Yeah. And um, actually co-wrote some other songs on the album with, uh, with Stevie. But Michael was pretty young, right, mm. when he auditioned. He was 17 years old. Yeah. And he said he was at home. I mean, he was really into jazz. And um, his friend, uh, Richie, yeah, Richie DeLorenzo, um, came by and told him about this audition and he should come with him because he wanted a band with, so his friend wanted a backup band with him. And so wanted Michael to go to this audition. And Michael, it was a Sunday morning and he wasn't necessarily feeling like it, right? But. He ends up going and yeah. Um, yeah, so he ends up auditioning for, you know, three hours basically. <laughs> and um, then he's, he's, when he asked to go to the restroom, um, they started talking. So he hears this conversation, you know, going on and they, they came over to him and basically said there was an argument going on because I guess they really wanted him. But the way that the um, the racial restrictions were at the time, they could only have one white guy in the band. Mm -hmm. And they really had a white trumpeter. And um, so I don't know how, exactly how they got around it, but he was hired. Yeah. So, I mean, things were changing a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, as well. So it was interesting, though, as we learned, you know, about some of those other bands, things were quite different. Yeah you know, when they were on the road, when they were traveling. Yeah. But, you know, this is early 70s, so things were changing a little yeah. bit. Um, but yeah, Michael, Michael Andrews Cimbello was born April 17th, 1954. He's an American singer, guitarist, keyboardist, songwriter, composer, and producer from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Cimbello was nominated for an Academy Award and a Go Golden Globe for his 1983 song, Maniac, which he sang and co-wrote. And of course, he's lead guitar on on s several of Stevie Williams yeah. um, productions. Ben Bridges. So Ben had just graduated from, or was finishing up at Temple University, and he was invited to audition for Stevie by, by Mike Cimbello. Um, so he, yeah, he took him to the audition and, and they, the two of them really clicked, yeah. played together really well. Um, and so from 1975, it says through 1992, Bridges was a sideman for Wonder, ringing his rhythm guitar on his on hits like Sir Duke, Ribbon in the Sky, and Do I Do, touring and, re uh, touring and recording as a member of his backup band. 
um, Wonder Love. Bridges has traveled the world with Motown's most recognizable artists. Mm. Uh, he currently lives in Maine. I think he works as a computer programmer. Oh, and, wow. Uh, he wanted, you know, change of his change of pace, but he really enjoyed these years with, wow. with Stevie, right? Uh, so let's talk about the horns, shall yes. we? Yes. So originally, um, Raymond Maldonado mm. um, was on trumpet. R Raymond and Maldonado and Steve Medeo. So Raymond's father gave him a set of bongos and a full trap kit when he was five and a couple of years later he became fascinated with the trumpet becoming proficient enough on the instrument to appear on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour mm. um, by the time he was 11 years old. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He attended the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music and the High School of Performing Arts in New York along with his brother Richard, a talented pianist who would go on to fame under the name Ricardo Ray. Um, by the time Ray Maldonado was in his late teens, he had already recorded professionally. Um, his fluid, fluid familiarity with jazz, Latin, soul, funk, and rock styles kept him in high demand as a session musician right up until his death on September 13th, 1982, of a drug overdose. Mm. So that was really sad. Yeah. Um, but um, didn't see too much about him in terms of... Um, you know, Research, yeah, yeah, video recordings, um, but we know that he, he he lives on forever with this um, original album. Yeah, one I noticed that when they uh, when they did their reunion tour, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they mentioned him. Yes, uh, when the group of yes. were standing around just chatting and uh, just how highly regarded he yes. was. Yeah, uh, and how sad they were that they that he was was gone mm -hmm. at that time. So mm -hmm. uh, highly regarded. A musician yes. and uh, just super talented. Yeah. So the other trumpet player, Steve Medeo, who actually just died a few years ago, um, but wow, he has quite a remarkable history. Uh, his trademark sound on dozens of million selling records was as distinctive as his black broad rimmed hat. Hmm. Medeo toured with the Rolling Stones in the 1970s and was a regular member of bands led by Stevie Wonder in the 1970s as well and Paul Butterfield in the 1960s. Uh, he recorded with such rock legends as Bob Dylan, John Lennon, Eric Clapton, Rod Stewart, Ringo Starr, and such blues and jazz greats as B.B. King, Etta James, Robert Cray, and Freddie Hubbard, and Billy Cole. Colham? Colham. Mm. Very well. That's a list. Yes. My goodness. Yeah. Really wow. Um, you know, it's actually very similar to Trevor Lawrence's list. <laughs> right? Mm. Trevor Lawrence actually played for a lot of those same people. Interesting. Rolling Stone. Yeah, pretty much um, a lot of those same ones. Uh, and he's still playing today. Uh, he started uh, playing sax when he was 11 years old. He was exposed to music theory and harmony when he was about 13 um, by his next door neighbor, Sol Moore, uh, an accomplished music arranger and baritone sax player with the Les Hilt Band. Um, he continued taking music lessons privately, playing in the school band while attending public school in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he has performed both as a studio musician and a touring musician in the horn section for groups including the Rolling Stones, uh, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band along with Bedeo, uh, David Sanborn and Gene Dinwiddle. They performed at Woodstock Music Festival in the 1960s. Mm. As an arranger, Lawrence collaborated on Etta James's 1962 album and on the Pointer Sisters 1982, so excited. Wow. Yes, uh, so actually he was married to Supreme, Linda Lawrence, uh -huh. and they have a son, Trevor Lawrence. Jr. born in 1973. I believe he's a musician as well. Wow. So, drums. Raymond Powell. Mm -hmm. learned a lot about Raymond. So, his, yeah. his parents died when he was pretty young. He mm -hmm. lost his parents when he was, when he was quite young. Yeah. Moved to California, um, LA area. Raised by family members. Yes. Yeah. And um, really, he, he got, was able to get some lessons. 
he started out with yeah so he was getting weekly lessons with with a guy named Clarence Johns didn't yep and he was supposed to practice a half an hour a day and he practiced three hours instead yeah mm -hmm. he was so passionate about yes, it yes yes and really learned learned how to read yeah. music right and um, charts which was instrumental in him getting the job with Stevie yep. years later. He started um, playing at, a, at Grant's Music Center yep. in Los Angeles, and it was through that that he was actually connected with Stevie, but he, he says it's not just who you know, it's what you know, yeah. right? That was one of the things I remembered from, mm -hmm. from that. Um, but what a player, yeah. just really, really great. Um, yeah history yep. uh, he also said that when Stevie called him to, to come audition or he was pl he, he was playing the roads uh, during the call yes, yeah during the phone call. Stevie, Stevie was playing yeah that. <laughs> that's awesome so that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. and the other thing he mentioned was that um, it was it was another guy because he didn't wasn't sure how to get to Stevie's house so it was another guy that came picked him up and they drove together mm -hmm. And Stevie was the one that came out of the house and opened the gate, mm -hmm. and he was sort of shocked at that, yeah. right? So yeah. for obvious reasons, but yeah. 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 The other sax player was Hank Red, and couldn't find a whole lot about Hank's life. Mm -hmm. There were some excerpts that we saw. Um, probably the most interesting was that in the songs in the Key of Life reunion, um, Hank talks about how broke he was, and he actually had to get his saxophone uh, out, out of the pawn, pawn shop. shop. Yeah. He had 80 bucks, or somebody gave him 80 bucks yeah. to get the, the, the saxophone out. And um, of course, the rest, the rest of that is history, history, right? Yeah. Because, because he was able to audition and um, take up, you know. Changed what, his life. Yeah, it definitely did. Yeah. So. so Nathan, I think we've got wow, Nathan, yeah. Nathan Watts. Bass player. Wow. Uh, Nathan says every song has a heart and a heartbeat. Yeah. Enough said. And he has become Stevie's manager, right? Ah. So he's been with Stevie since then. Yeah. And he's he's like family, right? Yeah. They're like brothers. And well, he tells the story where Stevie had lost a bass player, and uh, somehow he and Stevie got hooked up, and once they found that they were really grooving together, um, Nathan just told TV, I'm, I'm with you all from, I'll be with yes. you always, you know, yes. you can count on me. And, yeah. uh, and they have been together ever since. Yeah. What a blessing. Yeah. Stevie pretty much plays everything, yeah. <laughs> right? So that's what the other musicians would say too, is Stevie Wonder can play and he plays all the instruments. Yeah. And so it was really gracious of him to actually allow them to play yeah. you know on on uh, the albums yeah and in fact he a lot of the tracks he does the drums mm -hmm. um in addition to his keyboard playing mm -hmm. so a lot of the tracks on the album are actually him doing both keyboards and drums while the others came in and collaborated on some of the other tunes but yeah yeah that was pretty remarkable so um let's see wonder is credited as a pioneer and influence by musicians across a range of genres, genres that include rhythm and blues, pop, soul, gospel, funk, and jazz. Virtually a one-man band, his use of synthesizers and other electronic music instruments during the 1970s reshaped the conventions of R&B. He also helped drive the genre into the album era, crafting his LPs as cohesive, consistent, socially conscious statements with complex compositions. Yeah. I mean, he plays pretty much everything. The Rhodes, like what he was playing when he was on the phone um, yeah. with um, Raymond Pounds. The Rhodes piano, also known as the Fender Rhodes, is an elect electric piano invented by Harold Rhodes, which became popular in the 1970s. Like a conventional piano, the Rhodes generates sound with keys and hammers, but instead of strings, the hammers strike thin metal lines which vibrate next to an electromagnetic pickup. The signal is then sent through a cable to an external keyboard amplifier and speaker. Yeah. It's probably my favorite instrument. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I played a real one uh, with the band and it was, it's just, it just melts. 
Mm -hmm. right? It just melts. I mean, on the clavinol, you can kind of get the rose sound, but there's nothing like that real authentic yeah. rose that it just warms your heart and, yep. and melts you. Yep. So those are the musicians on the original recording. Yeah. So it's cool uh, watching the Sir Duke live at last mm -hmm. performance. He's, they're not the original musicians, but you can see a live performance of it. Yeah. And the backup singers, which Stevie does the backup on the song himself. I didn't. I didn't catch that really. Yeah. Wow. So, um, but yeah. So, so the live performance, and you get to see, you know, other musicians doing stuff, and it, it's really kind of cool. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit just about Stevie as we wrap up here. He said being at Motown was like being in a candy shop. Yes. Uh, and why not? In 1973, he was in an auto accident. Mm -hmm. It was just after Inner Visions was released. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he was in a car and a log came through the window and he was in a coma. Yeah, that that's a pretty horrific yeah. uh, accident. You know, a logging mm -hmm. truck in front and it, mm -hmm. and it comes right through the windshield, pops mm -hmm. him in the head. Mm -hmm. And first off, just to survive mm -hmm. that was, it was that was a miracle, yeah. 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 And then to not have any serious right uh, damage going forward. So he was in a coma, um, but in many ways, music ended up saving him. Yeah. And um, so he was playing his music, and, and he came to. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was before Songs in the Key of Life, yeah. right? So that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, w one of the things that I so appreciate about him, um, when they first signed the contract, when he was uh, mm -hmm. 11 years old or mm -hmm. 12, whatever it was, um, it was that whatever he was due was put into a trust fund, and it was, he wasn't paid until he was 21 years old. There was a stipend that his mother was given, you know, monthly to you know kind of help with the bills and things. Mm -hmm. But um, when he was 21, he he came back to Barry Gordy and they negotiated a contract where he had basically complete control, mm -hmm. and that was almost unheard of at the time. Marvin Gaye was a um, was the other one with Motown that did the same thing, but those two were the first to really. Um, take control of their own of their own musical destiny and um, I thought that was remarkable yeah and it really set a precedent for how musicians were to get paid yes um, and uh, so yeah just I, I just thought that was interesting yeah so Stevie was the youngest solo artist ever welcomed into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame um, he received the Kennedy Center honor sold more than a hundred million albums wow won the Billboard Century Award. He's got 25 Grammys, um, as well as the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award and many other hon honors. Mm -hmm. um, recently, a United Nations Messenger of Peace gave Stevie the rights to publish copyrighted pieces into structures to approach the visually impaired all around the world. Mm -hmm. Despite his many challenges, Stevie Wonder has always overcome them through music. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was asked what was his favorite song, or what was his, the best song he's ever written. And he said, like Duke, <laughs> um, it hadn't been written yet. Yeah. And he also says that each of his songs is a child mm. received from the hand of the Almighty. Wow. That was a really beautiful, yeah. beautiful quote. So a Jonathan Ross interview, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll kind of wrap it up with this. Um, Stevie comes out uh, with his daughter, actually, Aisha, who sings backup for him, mm -hmm. and, uh, brought him, you know, sat with him and brought him out. And he tells the story of hearing the phone ring. And he was, it's like, it turned out it was a dream, but at the time he didn't realize or think it was a dream. But the phone rang, somebody gave him the phone, and it was his mom. This is after his mother had died. And... Um, so he's talking with her and, you know, saying, you know, I miss you. How are you doing? And 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 basically she's saying that he's going to be okay. He said, I want to go where you are. Like, I want to be with you. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and because um, he, he said he hadn't felt like performing, he hadn't felt like doing anything. And then he got this phone call. And um, yeah, they talked and she, she was doing great and, and he was going to be okay. And, um, and then it's kind of like he woke up and he realized, oh, like that was a dream, but he didn't think it was a dream. It's like she was real. And after that, he, he really felt he had the courage and the feeling to continue mm -hmm. and go on with his music. On the same interview, he, he talks about um, another song, and I wanted to just share some of the lyrics of this song. Because Stevie Wonder has always been um, very socially conscious and mm -hmm. very caring, and I thought the words to this song really kind of sum up um, a lot about what was important to him. Okay, Fear Can't Put Dreams to Sleep is the name of the song. From out of the blue, there came to me a question, the kind that until you answer won't let you be. The question was, if I was blessed with the gift of sight, what most in the world would I want to see? That made me think of an old story about a boy who had no feet or hands who was asked if he could walk, what would he do? And he said, as I understand, if my eyes were to see, let them be the witness of a world that is color free. And if my limbs were to move, let me touch and walk in a land where hate could no longer be. And if my ears were to hear, let it like the sweetest music be in unity and harmony. And if my mouth were to speak, let me talk about a land where love's for all and fear can't put dreams to sleep. I thought that was really kind of a cool, yeah. a cool song. That's awesome. So, Songs in the Key of Life won Album of the Year at the 19th Grammy Awards. Mm. It's the best-selling and most critically acclaimed album of Wonder's career. Wow. Widely regarded as Wonder's magnum opus and one of the greatest albums in the history of recorded music. Yep. Many musicians have remarked on the quality of the album and its influence on their own work. Indeed, some notable musicians have named it as the greatest album of all time. Yeah. I think um, Elton John said he takes it with him everywhere he goes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know and that. Michael Jackson. Now, Stevie Wonder, he's a musical prophet. <laughs> he's another guy I have to credit. I wanted to experience it all. So Stevie Wonder used to literally let me sit like a fly on the wall. I got to see songs in the key of life get made, some of the most golden things. Wow. What an experience. Yeah. Herbie Hancock says he's an example of what the best a human being can be. He's an example of the best a human being can be. Quincy Jones said that Stevie Wonder is a terminal. Wow. One of my favorite quotes from Stevie Wonder is, without peace, we can't enjoy love. Without love, we can't really appreciate the significance of peace. And without either, we really can't live. Wow. So true. Yeah. Um, when Intervi Intervisions won a Grammy for Album of the Year in 1973, he refused to accept the award unless Lulu, his mother, would walk with him to the podium. Hmm. Uh, he clutched his mother in front of the auditorium and in front of the millions of people watching on television proclaiming her strength has led us to this place. Wow. Well. <sighs> yeah, what a, just a remarkable journey that we've been on just mm -hmm. to experience the process of researching this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been blessed by it in ways I can't even articulate quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just learning about the musicians that he spoke of in the song, um, you know, and really just scratching the surface. Yes. Yeah. There's so much more that, you know, depth that could be could be explored. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the musicians in his band and and I I have a far greater appreciation for Stevie Wonder than I've ever had. Yeah. And of course for the other musicians mm -hmm. that we've discussed here tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm eternally, I'm eternally grateful for the fact that he made this album. Yeah. Um, because it's uh, even today, 
uh, we're still talking about it mm -hmm. and the importance of it. And uh, not just the importance of the music itself, which is undeniable, mm -hmm. but the cultural, the social uh, implications of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just so impactful and so influential. Um, yeah. It's been a joy. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. so with that, we want to thank you for tuning in and uh, checking this out. We hope you've enjoyed it. And I really want to encourage you to go and check out every documentary you can on the people that we've discussed here. Because you will be uh, transformed much like we've been transformed. Uh, if you love music, if you love what music does to the soul, um, there's no other album, no other song, I think, that you could that you could look into that would have a greater impact uh, on your life moving forward. So, thank you again for joining us. Here's to Stevie Wonder. Here's to Stevie Wonder, and happy 72nd birthday this last May. Um, so yeah, thanks again. We'll see you down the road.